Being the second largest nation in the world, Canada surely dreams of lands, though the scientific community in Canada is in a state of shock after a recent event that has left many experts scratching their heads. What just happened in Canada has the potential to change the way we understand the world around us, and scientists are scrambling to make sense of it all. In addition to having a population density of barely 4 people per square kilometer, large swaths of Canada's tundra stretch beyond the Arctic Circle, putting the country in a strategic position between the Arctic and the United States split in a manner analogous to that of the United States of America. In the western half of the country, the Rocky Mountains run in a direction from north to south, and the prairies provide enormous growing regions for grain and canola. Because it is home to Canada's three largest cities, Toronto, Montreal, and Ottawa, the east coast of the country is often referred to as the historical heart of the country. It is a wide country with cold winters, stunning fall displays, a colorful, rich, and diverse people, and it is easily regarded as one of the most prosperous and peaceful countries in the world. Despite its size, the country has a large population. Additionally, a recent survey ranked Canada as the sixth happiest nation on the entire planet. Arctic conditions are shifting fast. While the globe as a whole is beginning to feel the effects of global warming, nowhere is seeing changes as dramatic as the Arctic. After all, the Arctic is warming two to three times faster than anywhere else on Earth according to scientific estimates. The nature of things under thin ice follows extreme diver and underwater explorer Jill Heinerth as she journeys to Greenland and Canada's far north to record the changes taking place above and below the Arctic's rapidly melting ice. Heinerth claims that global warming is affecting the Arctic more rapidly than any other region, and it's so clear in this example. The sea ice is constantly changing. It changes volume as it warms and cools as it melts and hardens. Heinerth explains, When you stand here, on the ice in the silence of the Arctic, you feel like you're on a stable platform of ice, but you're not. They say it's a living, breathing entity. An average of 25 million square kilometers of Earth's surface is covered by sea ice at any given time of the year. That's an area almost two and a half times the size of Canada, but it's receding rapidly, sending fresh water gushing into the world's oceans and influencing both sea levels and ocean currents. The entire ecosystem relies on this sea ice because it serves as a home for endemic species that exist nowhere else on Earth. The light seeping through the ice provides an environment for microscopic algae and plankton, which in turn provide food for fish and whales, which are then consumed by seals, beluga whales, and narwhals. The polar bear is the top predator on Earth. The amount of sea ice present in the Arctic in September, after the melting season of summer has ended, is decreasing at a pace of nearly 13% every decade. Algae are in danger, and the food web is starting to break down as a result of the melting ice. More than 70% of the sea ice in the Arctic is now seasonal ice, which melts and recovers every year. But every year it takes longer for it to freeze over in the autumn and longer for it to melt away in the summer. By 2040, some scientists believe the Arctic Ocean will have essentially no summer ice at all. The icy poles of Earth have long served as a natural refrigerator. 80% of the sun's heat is reflected off the snow-covered ice, keeping the temperature constant. However, 80-90% to of it gets absorbed by open water, increasing the temperature of the water and setting off a feedback loop that accelerates the melting process. As the Arctic warms, one model predicts that the last ice area will remain the longest. Its proximity to the coasts of Nunavut and northern Greenland means it has the potential to serve as a future concentrated habitat for ice-dependent species. Even if the Arctic's vast and unique ecology were to be preserved, it would be a shadow of its former beauty and even the last ice area is not safe from the effects of global warming. Wildlife in the Arctic had a hard enough time finding ice in the summer as it is. Tundra plants increase in height, and the Arctic becomes greener as summers get longer and warmer. There are currently species of animals that can thrive in both polar regions vying for food and habitat. Red foxes are expanding their range northward, where they compete with native Arctic foxes for resources. As this gruesome shot by Dan Gotowski illustrates, they often find themselves pitted against one another. It's possible that some species have been around for a while but have been inactive for up to a million years and are now making a comeback. Melting glaciers have unleashed ancient viruses and germs that could infect humans and other creatures. The Arctic's greening also introduces new environmental dangers. Carbon dioxide is being released into the atmosphere at increased rates from wildfires on the tundra. Greenhouse gas emissions are increased as soils thaw releasing nutrients that bacteria can then consume. The rapid thawing of permafrost is another concerning impact 
of a greening Arctic. A process known as sudden thawing occurs when the ground surface collapses due to the warming and thawing of permafrost, the permanently frozen soil beneath the tundra. This collapse creates ponds and canals that speed up the melting process. Roughly 20% of the Arctic's permafrost is at risk from sudden thawing, which may unleash billions of tons of carbon dioxide and methane, an even more potent greenhouse gas, storing 28 times more heat than carbon dioxide. The number of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere might double as a result of this thaw, which isn't fully accounted for in current climate models. As the Arctic warms, one of the most destructive invasive species on Earth can now enter for the first time. Talking about fire has always been an element of the natural world. It was a component of the terrain even before humans walked the Earth. But are the fires we see today becoming more dangerous over time? According to the findings of scientists, climate change is affecting wildfires, making them both more often and more destructive. Scientists who study climate change have issued a warning that a one-degree increase in temperature results in a 12% increase in the number of lightning strikes. Lightning strikes are responsible for 45% of all forest fires that occur in Canada. This year was the hottest and driest fire season on record for the province of British Columbia. Around the world, countries as diverse as Portugal, Chile, and California have been ravaged by lethal wildfires. However, those who live in or near natural environments aren't the only ones that are exposed to a more hazardous setting. Even people who live in cities are at a greater risk. It used to take around 17 minutes for a house to completely catch fire from the time the smoke alarm went off until the fire spread throughout the entire structure. As of right now, residents have no more than three and a half minutes to get out of there. We have made the conscious decision to locate our homes in proximity to high-risk zones for wildfires. More and more of us choose to live in what is known as the Wildland Urban Interface, which is located on the edge of a forest or grassland. Scientists working for the Canadian Forest Service have found that 60% of our communities are facing a greater risk of being destroyed by wildfires. If you summed up all of the lands that are in danger, it would span approximately one half of the territory of Alberta. Embers, which are very few fires, are frequently the cause of damage to homes. When there is a large forest fire, most people believe that the massive flames or the radiant heat are to blame for the residences that catch fire in the surrounding area. However, the tiniest embers, which are the flaming remnants of burned bark, branches, and cones, are typically the cause of the fires that begin on front or backyard lawns and quickly spread to the home. 2017 was a terrible one for Western Canada. The province of BC saw its biggest fire on record, and about 900,000 hectares were consumed by flames. In 2016, one of the most damaging fires in the country raged through Fort McMurray. The blaze was responsible for the destruction of approximately 2,500 buildings and forced the evacuation of 90,000 residents of the city. It was the most expensive natural disaster in the history of Canada. If it rains more in the winter, then more grass will grow in the spring. On the other hand, longer summers with higher temperatures will make the risks of wildfires greater. When the weather is hot and dry, the grass turns into a fuel source that is easily combustible, which turns our woodlands into a powder keg that is ready to go off. What we are up against is described by Flanagan as follows. The warmer we get, the more fire we have. The greater the number of fires we have, the greater the emission of greenhouse gases. The more gases that are released into the atmosphere, the warmer the planet will get. A circle that never breaks. These ferocious fires are burning deeper into the soil, which is where the vast majority of the boreal forest's carbon is stored. According to Dr. Jill Johnstone, a lecturer at the University of Saskatchewan, these forests are part of the lungs of the planet. The boreal forest is responsible for storing around 50% of the world's total soil carbon. This carbon is discharged in a plume of smoke directly into the atmosphere as the intensity of the fires increases, which continues the cycle of warming the environment. If there is more drought, there will be less food available. The Golden State, California, has been suffering under a severe drought for several years. The snowpack has decreased as a result of shorter winters in recent years. If there is less snow in the winter, there will be less water that melts into the rivers and valleys in the spring. These are the areas where agriculture land is located. The agriculture sector of California has suffered widespread devastation. The majority of the food that is consumed in North America is produced in this region. Nevertheless, many residents of California are dissatisfied with the fact that their precious water is being used to generate food for other people. The prognosis of geologist Nick Isles is that in the not-too-distant future, they will want water from their northern neighbors in exchange for fresh vegetables. Water for vegetables, it may come to that, adds Isles, it may come to that. 
threats to the survival of the gray jay and other species of wildlife in Canada. The species that reside in the boreal forest all across Canada is already being threatened by the effects of climate change. Here is only one illustration of the many different kinds of animals that are in jeopardy. The gray jay is a very small bird that stays here during the entire winter. It does this by storing food in the branches of trees, which acts like a refrigerator for the animal. However, mild winters are causing their food supplies to run out sooner than usual. By the time spring arrives, there is little left for them to feed their ravenous chicks. We have reached the point of no return and this is the opportune moment to take action. Our planet is in danger. As a result of increasing global temperatures, the acidity of oceans, an increase in the frequency and severity of forest fires, and rising sea levels. George Monbiot, an esteemed journalist and environmentalist, condemned the environmental exploitation that has occurred throughout the past few decades. According to him, we've lost 30 years or more, which is the amount of time during which we could affect a gradual transition out of the destructive, extractive economy into a far more benign one. Yet, here we are, perched precariously on the edge of a precipice. However, as a result of the COVID-19 outbreak and the subsequent shutdown of economies around the world for an extended period, we may have the ideal opportunity to take action. According to Monbiot, if there is one thing that the recent shutdown of economies around the world has taught us, it is that we can adapt rapidly and live with significant change. The pandemic has provided us with the opportunity to construct a new society. According to Monbiot, this new world should have an economy that respects the lives of future generations and does not sacrifice those lives for the wealth of current generations, an economy that can be sustained without trashing our life support systems. And now is the time for us to take the opportunity. As we emerge from this pandemic, we will have the opportunity to build on that mutual assistance to create the better societies that we require. That's all for the video today. We will be right back. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.